Thanks for inviting me to speak, and everybody, thank you so much for coming. My name is Allison Holt, and um, I'm an artist here in San Francisco. And I am here to give you an overview of a project that I did as a Fulbright Fellow in Central Java, Indonesia, as in, and it's called The Beginning Was the End. The project is um, about traditional Javanese culture and how it intersects with my own philosophy, basically. Um, but before I get into the project, I want to just give you a little bit of background on myself and how I go about making the work that I make. Um, I'm originally from Virginia, and um, my father's a mechanical engineer. My mother's a little bit more of a, from a spiritual persuasion, and uh, I benefit from this sort of odd confluence of DNA um, as an artist. And, uh, about 30 years ago, my mother moved with me from the East Coast to the West Coast, and I've been largely on my own since then. Um, and I want to paraphrase from a recent TED Talk that uh, the poet Lem Sisse gave. He talks about how children who grow up outside of the construct of family um, tend to reflect upon their experience of reality far differently than most other people do. They use extraordinary skills to deal with extraordinary situations on a daily basis. And um, my own art practice has developed in this way, most definitely. I, um, um, I use uh, combinations of, um, I, well, I'll say, I, 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 my artwork focuses on um, the templates that we place upon reality and um, how systems of thinking uh, create different um, ways of, I, I'm sorry, I'm referring to my notes a little bit too much. Um, how, how, uh, um, how systems of thinking um, generate different ways of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm flubbing a little bit. I'm going to have to look at my notes really quick. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, how systems of thinking construct um, experiences of reality that, fun that differ fundamentally and how they lead to ways of knowing um, that are radically different around the world. And my own art practice um, combines uh, video and sculpture, later on I'll refer to that as video sculpture, um, diagrams, uh, performance, and sound installation. I, I often work with sound artists. Um, and I use all of these in concert to create models and environments that um, explore, they, they expose this, uh, this um, interpenetration that I see between um, knowledge, belief, and cognition, between waking and dreaming consciousness, and between uh, alternate and uh, tangible realities. Um, so I want to begin my presentation by asking you if you had to create an image of how you understand reality, what would it look like? As an artist, this is exactly the kind of interpretation that I do. And this project is presenting um, my translations of how the Javanese traditionally understand the world. Um, all of the images that you see are uh, entirely based on my experience in Java and um, they're not, I, I didn't find any other images of this kind of knowledge while I was there. So um, this uh, research took place in 2008. It, it began in 2008 in a small village in, um, where I lived in central Java, in, um, just outside of the city of Surakarta. And while I was there, I started a language and cultural exchange with a Javanese Dalam. Um, a shadow puppet master, and um, while I was talking with him one day, I just started telling him my own ideas about human nature and reality, and I described these using a Venn diagram in which one circle represented uh, nature, the other represented heaven, and the place in between represented uh, the phenomenon that embodies both of these things, human beings. These circles also represented um, conscious reality, dreaming reality, and the place where both can be experienced. And as I'm describing these things to him, he's getting more and more excited, and he started asking me if I understood that this is how the Javanese see the world. 
And it was a really extraordinary moment that just ignited a new level of understanding between us and um, laid the groundwork for me to come back the following year as a Fulbright Fellow. Um, our other conversations were about something called the Tantal Palukon, which is a, a perennial calendar. This device expresses time in terms of infinite cyclical patterns of natural and social and supernatural forces. And according to the Tatal, each day reveals this intersecting complex of these energies. And they're expressed in compressed detail as a single symbol carved in a block of wood. So each day that's ever been or will be has its own character, its own soul. So some of you may wonder if I have a background in anthropology. I do not. Um, my work is driven more by science fiction and by philosophy, um, by cognitive science and just a little bit of modern physics. So, but you know, what do all of these things have in common with Javanese knowledge? It's uh, what I see is the practitioners of all of these different disciplines have something similar in among them that um, it's their, the way they experience um, their world, the way they uh, approach themselves, the way they orient themselves in time and space. And um, Javanese knowledge actually assumes as accomplished fact a lot of the things that we still struggle popularly in the West to understand through science. Things like how our perception, um, the way, uh, the, the, the senses that we use to perceive the world, the perception that we have represents an extremely narrow band of what there is here to see. And that the objects that are uh, in our, our world that we're participating with here, the, the, uh, these things are not dead, that they're actually vibrating living matter, and that in Japanese thinking, we're actually participating with these things. We're interacting with them, we're interacting with these forces that we're not able to actually see. So I was interested in this, the structure of thinking that supports this experience of enjoying the world this way, and, um, and in the ways of, uh, of interacting with um, alternate dimensions. And I was curious what people are actually experiencing in these alternate dimensions, um, what they're, what's happening in the alternate dimensions, how the tools have developed to navigate across them, and what those tools might be. This is an example of one, this is called Ruatan, is a ritual that um, is used to, uh, it, it basically it's, um, a ritual that acknowledges uh, the residue that is left behind from a negative event. So say there's a car crash or a rape, these things are leaving a knot in the energy that is, that is part of the um, world that we're existing in. And that knot, that negative energy is looked at as if it has its own wants and needs and character. It's an entity that actually lives in the space where it occurred. So this is something that we can use Ruatan to address. What we're doing when we use Ruatan is using all of the different aspects of Javanese culture, we're bringing them together, and they're working in concert to um, address this knowledge, or to, to address this, uh, this knot that's in, uh, say, an individual, and seduce it out, to take that negative energy out of the individual and return it to the uh, constant flow of positive and negative forces that are always around us. So this is something that became the central focus of my research. And um, until recently, it was actually the, the cornerstone for um, Japanese culture. Um, this is uh, me actually receiving Ruatan at the hands of Pak Sutino, um, who's the oldest living Dalang or, or, and or um, Dukko nerds, shaman in central Java at this point. Um, Ruatan can be performed on an individual, a group of individuals, a place like it could be performed on the University of San Francisco and uh, or the White House. Um, <laughs> let's see, this the um, Tatsutino and his son Mirianto actually performed it on the Smithsonian back in the 90s. They performed there for about three months and um, Mirianto teaches at UC Berkeley. He's the uh, leader of Gamelan Sari Raras. And he uh, translated my dialogues with Patsutino um, 
And in doing that, he was realizing like the work that I was doing had not been done before. He was, you know, asking me if I was aware of that, and uh, apparently it's original research. Um, I want to give you guys something to hang your hat on, like just an idea that is a bit of an overview of, of Javanese philosophy. So um, that idea would be that the reality that we exist in is a living metaphysical field that we're all participating in. We're interacting with the world. We're not just acting upon it. And um, I want to read to you, I, I actually am going to, let me see if I can read from here. Um, I'm going to read to you from the top of this diagram just to be succinct. The humans enter this world with four brothers and sisters, siblings, saudara. Um, black represents wisdom or ill will, red, anger, yellow, desire, specifically sexual desire, uh, pure, white, purity, and this shaft that's in the center uh, represents the, your connection to God or information or whatever you want to call the thing that's larger than you. Um, uh, let's see. These are the sources of human suffering, and they determine one's obstacles to achieving life balance, to connecting to one's center, um, holding influence <coughs> over human perception. They have the power to obscure the truth, and they fill the substance of the world. The four elements, the cardinal directions, the Javanese days of the week, the Javanese alphabet, one's relationship with each of them can be fed through fasting, through sleep deprivation, through meditation. So what it's describing is um, human characteristics are, uh, th these four aspects, these fundamental aspects of human characteristics are constellated in the fabric of the world that we experience. And we are actually looking at the cardinal directions as though they're having their own character. They are uh, living things and we're again we're participating with them we can see ourselves as related to them much more uh, fundamentally than even our own uh, flesh and blood relations if water decided to check out right now we'd be in sore shape so um, there are uh, pretty fascinating details that I would love to talk with you about and because of time I'm gonna skip if, if you want to bring it up in q and I would love to to talk about how time and language are related to one another. Um, so this knowledge is no longer being taught to children in Java. And um, after hearing Midianto's comments, I was really driven to um, create my diagrams in the style of Indonesian educational posters, like this one you see right here. It's just to create a tool for um, deeper conversation in a classroom setting. Um, they've, they've been translated into Indonesian, and it's my goal to go back and, and introduce them as like an intervention into classrooms there. This is an example of my own artwork as explained through Javanese knowledge. This is something that I drew at age 18, and it just happens to explain basic concepts of Javanese philosophy, little did I know. Um, so these are still really like abstract intellectual constructs. And what I was really interested in doing was creating for you a, a visceral sense of uh, Javanese or, or um, multi-dimensional being, like what it's like to actually experience multi-dimensional <coughs> reality. So I created a series of video sculptures, um, and uh, this is a, a part of the whole body of work um, that was on display in Yogyakarta in 2010, it's a, a, was a solo exhibition. Um, I created a series of video sculptures. There's an example over here. Um, and uh, we can just look at a video. If it'll play, hopefully, here we go. Oh, there's no sound. So um, sound is a little bit important for this. And uh, if we can get it going, then it would be really great. But if we can't, I'll just describe to you. You can hear it a little bit through there. No speakers. Yeah, if it works, it's fine. If it doesn't work, it's fine, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just describe to you what you're looking at, and that is um, polyester resin cubes 
that have within them cast negative shapes that you can see. And there's video that's playing um, that's been mapped directly to these shapes. So um, what they represent is a uh, three-dimensional chunk that's been erased out of the fabric of reality that we are experiencing right now. If we could do that, if we could just take a chunk out of space right here, what we might see is the flow of energy and forces that our senses don't allow us to perceive. We know they're there. This is giving you um, not an object, but the absence of an object. So this is an example of another, uh, of, of another piece in this series. This is, these are called hypercubes for that reason. And um, this, all, all of the pieces are like three-dimensional models of my diagrams. This is another diagram that is basically just my impression of what I was immersed in there. That's um, a ruatan, one of the rituals that I mentioned earlier. Um, here's another piece. And is sound going to work? No? Sound will try. OK, no problem. Um, I will just describe to you what you will be hearing then. So uh, again, these, this video sculpture um, is one iteration of the overall experience that you would receive with the beginning was the end. The sound installation is um, coming from the, like, th this, this exhibition is taking place in a, um, an open air traditional building that um, was totally dominated by street traffic. I mean, the noise was intense, so I decided to make use of it by miking it and uh, playing the, uh, uh, putting that sound through a series of filters that um, gives you like an alternate dimension experience of that, uh, those masses pushing through space out in front of the building. So that augmented sound is playing on top of the ambient noise. And I'm going to skip ahead just for the sake of time. So I worked with um, members of the House of Natural Fiber to do the um, video sculptures and the sound installation. This is a new media laboratory in Jakarta. I worked with um, master artisans and artists. This is uh, Badri Mustafa in the middle of the jungle making those hypercubes and carving this uh, frog figure that you saw earlier. Um, the, be the future of the beginning was the end is uh, something that, that there are several different iterations and one of the main goals is to return this knowledge to the younger generations that are losing it. Um, how are we doing on time, Peter? Are we at 20? You have three or four more. Okay, great. So I think um, Indonesia is Indonesia is, is definitely uh, experiencing the residue of its own um, negative events. In 1965, a US-backed military coup led to the extermination of 1.5 million people in the span of a single year. And um, the people who were responsible for those um, death squads are still, they were elevated to public office and they're still in power and they live alongside their victims' families. And this, this has led to a, a, a climate of corruption over the last 30 years um, that is uh, allowing for, the Japanese culture is actually, it, it, it's alive and well, but the younger, younger generations are not um, receiving it. So um, the you know, ubiquitous Western media influences and uh, radical Islamic schools are kind of like, they're, they're in a tug of war over the attention of younger people. And my idea is to take the diagrams that I've um, created and kind of use the backdoor method of what's sexy to young kids is like new technology um, packaging their own traditional knowledge and their own uh, way of knowing into um, uh, package like like uh, at games or apps. Most everybody uses cell phones there. So this is one of the um, one of the initiatives that's coming out of the beginning was the end. And um, with that, I think I want to thank all of the people that have supported this project. The Fulbright Foundation. San Francisco Arts Commission just gave me a really nice grant to put on the, um, the
the US-based um, solo exhibition here in San Francisco. I'm looking for venues if anybody wants to support that. Um, and Timothy Art House is where I created the artwork and uh, to all of the individual donors who supported it as well. And Margot Gerritsen just um, very graciously curated the um, diagram series at the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford. So thank you very much for <laughs> Questions? I have a question, but I give priority. So the, the, the most famous uh, thing about Indonesian culture is Ghana. Yeah. yeah. So did you see any connections between uh, what you were doing and uh, Ghana? Absolutely. Gamelan is like one iteration of of this philosophy that I'm describing. It's um, the forms that take place in Gamelan are. Like, there, it's one expression of um, this underlying way of knowing the world. So is batik, and so is wayang, so is shadow puppet play. All of the things that the Westerners see as, as you know, beautiful art forms that come out of there, each of these things are totally constellated with one another. They're, they're, they don't exist in uh, any separate way in Indonesia, so. Yeah. In your uh, next phase of your project, where you're sort of trying to repackage this traditional knowledge um, for younger generation, do you have plans to do any collaborative work with young people? Uh, do you do that? Um, I would like to do that. It's hard to do it from afar. Um, mm -hmm. I am still in touch with all of the new media folks that I was working with there. Um, I also was just recently invited to. Um, apply as a full, as a fellow at the at the Smithsonian Institution by a senior geographer there. So um, hopefully that will kind of grease the wheels of actually developing stuff. But the folks who I am working with on the ground there are interested in, in actually like you know making it happen. Yeah. yeah. Can you say two words about this? Yeah. Sure. Um, so. These hypercubes just arrived from Los Angeles. They, they got left behind in Indonesia for about a year after I left. Um, they got a little manhandled and had to be completely refinished. So it took a year to find another, another year to find um, a studio that could do that work. Due to EPA standards, most California studios won't work with um, resin. So. <laughs> this is just a sample, and it is. It, this is what would have video playing inside of it. So you saw this um, in one of the video uh, samples that I showed earlier. Um, and you're welcome to come check it out. The other piece that you saw, the three-dimensional frog figure, broke in an earthquake mm -hmm. after oh. three days on view in my <laughs> solo show. So I was wondering why the symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, any other questions for now? Yes. Yes. Um, you just mentioned an earthquake. What are the natural events? Uh, how are they in the philosophy there? In the dimensional ideas? Well, you can die really easily. I think that because mud bubbles up out of the earth and the, you know, you're in the ring of fire, there's so many opportunities for, the, for nature to just be like on you. Um, I think that there's a, a in, in places where there's a, a lot of potential for natural disasters, people's relationship to death is different than ours. And so you're, um, you're I, I, I just think that you're conscious of nature in a different way and have a different type of uh, respect in relation to that. Um, uh, there weren't any like specific mentions of like you know earthquakes in the studies that I was doing. If that's what you're asking about, like well, my Indonesian friends are very superstitious. If if a volcano erupts or if there's an earthquake, it's an omen. Mm -hmm. Does that come out of your philosophy, or is that just a more um, I think that, you know, those natural events are definitely part of the, the flow, like, w Indonesians are, or at least the Javanese, what I know is Javanese uh, philosophy, and, and um, this is a feeling-based 
frame of reference. It's a way of orienting yourself in the world from a feeling place, not from a rational, intellectual place. So this is actually quite difficult for us to grasp. But um, when we uh, understand nature in terms of having its own identity and having its own character, it is, it's got its own like wants and needs and it's going to do what it wants to do, but we can be in concert with that. Um, we can understand it and maybe anticipate some of those things if we're aware of what we're dealing with. So depending on how, how well we know ourselves in relation to nature is something that will help us you know, uh, you know, know what to do with an earthquake or be able to anticipate or something like that again. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Okay, thank you very much.